Welcome to Chewing on a Ruby Passport, our 2020 Arts Queensland Poet in Residence Showcase. I'm Zenobia Frost from Queensland Poetry, and I'm beaming to you from unceded Yagara and Turbo land here in Mianjin, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. 2020 marked the 15th year of our Poet in Residence program. So I want to thank Arts Queensland for their unwavering support of a project that year by year raises the bar for poetry and spoken word in Brisbane and beyond. I also want to thank Kent McCarter, managing editor of Cordite Poetry Review, who's put together an incredible digital chapbook of the work you're about to hear. Thanks to Shamila at Spoken Volumes for helping source our UK talent, UQP for sending over book packs for us to post out, and to Brisbane's own Jackie Ryan for the cover art of this project. But the biggest thanks go to our residents themselves, Ivan Coyote, Amina Atik, Kate Durbin, and Nick McCoa. It's been a pleasure getting to know you, to work with you, and see your influence and spark here in Queensland, even from so far away. We've commissioned our resident writers to whip up new work inspired by their experience with Queensland poetry. You can read these at Cordite, the link will be in the description box below, but I'd love for you to hear them. So I'd like to introduce the three performers we're featuring today. Amina Atik is a Yemeni scouse writer, performance artist and activist. She's a Curious Minds Young Associate and BBC Words First finalist 2019. Atik's work explores the conflict of her dual identity, of her heartland, Yemen, and her homeland, Liverpool. Amina is such an engaging performer and a compassionate workshop facilitator. We can't wait to meet her in person one day soon. Kate Durbin is an LA-based artist and writer. Her books include Hoarders, which is out now with Wave Books, E! Entertainment, and The Ravenous Audience. Kate is no stranger to Brisbane. She was our 2015 Arts Queensland Poet in Residence, and we loved her so very much that we brought her back. Check out her work in Korda and you will see why. And then Ivan Coyote is a Canadian writer and storyteller, the author of 12 books, the creator of four films, three albums and an international touring performer. Coyote's 2019 book, Rebent Sinner, is autumn and their new book, Care Of, is forthcoming with Penguin Random House. They're a delight to work with and if you have yet to see them perform, you're about to find out how glued to your screen you can get. So thank you, Amina, Kate, and Ivan. I'm going to hand it over to you now. Hi guys, and welcome to my poetry set. I'm going to be performing um, a couple of poems that I'm really excited about. But the most important one for me is definitely the commissioned one that I've done for Queensland Poetry Festival. It's been an interesting journey. As you can see, I am filming in my bedroom. I have a fancy mic because I want to feel like a performer, just a little bit. Um, and, you know, this was developed, you know, with limited sources of inspiration. But I think books, books had saved me. So I want to say thank you for sending us a collection of books. Um, because this is where I've been inspired to write, definitely. So this is called Golden Eagle. And it is a poem based on identity. Um, you can't get enough of poetry about identity. It's... Um, it's a topic that I shall continue probably for a very long time. So, Golden Eagle. I'm a dark horse. I'm a dark horse beating down the door somewhere my childhood escaped the streets. Etching three syllables of my name beneath the old city of Babel, Yemen. A woman dressed in black found me. Shackled to the gates, it was my mother chewing on her ruby passport. It's time to leave. It's time to leave. 
Goodbyes past the northern valleys greeted the southern blue waters, unlocking the fisherman's red sea. Colony crown reeked of death, buried in my foreign blood. And martyrs will meet life and justice will dance on the heads of the snakes. It turned cold quickly over the Mediterranean. This Yemeni girl sings British anthems between her terrace walls and I lost a part of me. I lost a part of me. I forgot the taste of my mother's milk with her nipple gritted between my teeth. And I taught my mother how to speak English, translating her hospital letters, the cold is eating her bones. I skipped school to escape the scouse boys who lurk at bus stops singing riddles of camels, curry and beladen headlines. A heartbreak worth to be torn between two homes. If my racist neighbour daydreams our women in two-piece sets and golden headbands and white polished toes in the sand I deserve my honour I deserve my honour and I lost a part of me in this dining room learning to use a knife and fork we don't eat Sunday roast fish and chips porky pie or go to the pubs I like my fingers and my food and coffee before I sleep and I lost a part of me I lost a part of me in this corner shop. Grandad left selling mocha beans, broken dreams, broken biscuits for half a penny. Why here? Why here? This Yemeni girl sings British anthems. British bombs between her terrace walls. She wears home. And this dress fits perfectly. Thank you. Um, yeah it's nice to hear poetry out loud for the first time so my my next piece is called uh, Backbencher and this is inspired by my father growing up in Liverpool in the UK um, a big Liverpool fan but also acknowledging that it was the 80s so what was you know, growing up like for my father. Backbencher. I saw my father cry for the first time. He gave birth to the city to remind me home. It sketched across his belly. The sirens did not stop yelling. We kept on running. And this will never be our game to play. And my father spat the city out of his mouth. Chanting her anthem in his foreign tongue. The red flag is the only song he knew. And I saw my father cry for the first time. He scruffled his hands in the mud to find the secret between our borders is the difference between this city and men in suits who suck their thumbs and fiddle their fingers in our pockets. And young men like my father, black curly hair, brown eyes, mock her skin, Curled their tongues in their political lingo, they sat on back benches and learnt to watch from a distance. And I saw my father cry for the first time. He cradled the city in his arms, waiting to be loved. But all he knew that this glory does not belong to people like him. And the red flag is the only song he knew. When my father died of a heartbreak, he told me to never give up on this city. For no first love kills with a dagger. Thank you. So, moving on. um, This is a poem called Victory is Far From Ours. And the question is, who does victory belong to? And this was really inspired by the Arab Spring and around, you know, the, the conflicts around the Middle East and the surrounding areas. And I started questioning you know, you know, who, 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 what is victory and who is, who does it belong to? And it definitely does not belong to me, does not belong to people like us. And 
does it even belong to anyone? Victory is far from ours. I married the world to understand it, but the earth is too dry, perished in complete darkness to paint blue skies. Because when was the last time I looked up? In a waiting storm to wash away the streets of wasted blood. In the rain we keep on dancing to find that victory is far from ours. And I hid under classroom desks meddling my fingers in someone else's story, guarded by warlocks, to blindly see what was beneath paper made of ashes and the terror that lives in our children. Between the bullet and the trigger is God's given right to live. And I hid under classroom desks, learning of the great wars in my own ink, of my forefathers we yet to name. Bleeding to death inside of me and a gravestone found in heaven. Yesterday's history is a calamity in our world of a thousand mothers and an orphan child lost on the street searching for a rightful home. Our secret between borders, between the oppressor and the man-made missiles is God's given right to live. And I hid under classroom desks, skipping pages as my eyes grew confused of black and white moving pictures and we part ways, waving our greetings and farewells. Is another suicide in our trenches? Is a child cradling war in its first steps in the rubbles of destruction and when death is part of their national anthem, then what is victory? Drowning in army coats, standing in line bigger than their feet, swinging AK-47s around their necks, and digging holes in their back gardens with their names engraved in headstones. Between the missile and the target is God's given right to live. Cradling war in our arms is not our victory. And waiting for victors to write history is not our victory. And guarded by the oppressed is not our victory. And victory is far from ours and it does not belong to me. Thank you. Oh, that got me quite emotional, didn't it? I am, I am sensitive. Um, um, As I always say to myself, if the poem, if I... If the things I write do not move me, then is it worth writing? Um, so the next piece is my mother's anthem in a foreign place. What I what I really enjoyed about this poem is that, <clears throat> you know, poetry is it's a powerful source. You know, it and different writers use poetry for different things. But one thing about poetry that people really misunderstand or don't actually understand its power is is um, what it does for the writer. So advice for anyone watching this, if you really enjoy um, or you're inspired by a writer and you ever get the chance to meet them, the f- any question, the first question you know, you can ask them is why they write, because I think that's a powerful question to ask, um, because every writer will have a very different response, but, um, and I just want to thank, um, you guys for joining me, um, and staying with me, (laughs) um, till the end, but also I just want to thank, um, Queensland Poetry Festival for, um, inviting me remotely and it's just been an interesting and surprising and overwhelming I mean so many emotions in the past uh, end of year and going into the new year and it's just been lovely to join from Liverpool all the way to Australia um, but I do hope that we get to meet very soon and we are in the same room performing um what we what we love (laughs) so which is poetry so i'm going to end with this piece my mother's anthem in a foreign place and this talks about a lot of traumatic series growing up in secondary school and facing racism for the first time
Mother's anthem in a foreign place. Girls like us go to war every day. We placed on our armies, tucked in our school shirts, lifted our skirts, chasing those white boys down double-decker buses. You racist prick, I shouted. Running down Queen's Drive as he chased me with a knife. Because girls like us, forced to learn English quicker, to save us from a stab wound in our backs. We wore expensive running shoes, hanging our keys from our necks, to let them know that we are coming. Because girls like us, settled in a foreign place, and we buried our mother's tongue in our back gardens to find the root of our grown even deeper. A sacrifice that haunts you every time you sing your mother's anthem, but you keep on dancing. You keep on dancing because girls like us grew balls with pink bows. And we passed borders with our homes on our backs, dancing to to step melody around the immigration officer. I flutter my tongue, recite my tribal name, explaining to him why I still smell like my grandma's spices and lime. Because girls like us are told to throw our veils in the river. No letter box delivers here. And you wait for Trump to blow his trumpet and kiss the face of Boris Johnson, but you hide behind your curtain, sucking on your mother's olives, but you keep on dancing. You keep on dancing. Because girls like us learned how to defend ourselves. Because some girls ducked the snowballs across the road, but girls like us learned to throw rocks back in their glass windows as he pointed at me. How were you a Scouser? How were you a Scouser? Because Scousers are white and you're a packy. See, girls like us is every tear behind every school bus stop telling your mother that school was okay today as you run up the stairs hiding the scars on your face and going home only men singing your mother's anthem in a foreign place but it's too broken to sit so you stutter her vows like Elif Ba'ta Wahdati Wahdati Ummati Ummati Thank you From Hoarders. I'm Dawn, the kid from a small town who made it big and a big. Welcome to Las Vegas Vintage Neon Sign. Walk up to my door and say, Open Sesame. Mannequins sunning on the roof of a mansion with totem poles in the yard and Egyptian hieroglyphs on the front door. I've lived on Dawn's luck. Humongous lantern from the Aladdin Hotel and Casino. I feel sorry for so-called normal people. Seat with a paper sign taped to it that says, Seat where Buzz Aldrin sat in blue Sharpie. They should be saving the stuff that they like. Imperial Stormtrooper helmet and a Star Trek jersey. I collect medical heads and brains of people I've operated on. Jars of brains and yellow liquid. I have a huge collection of skulls. Photo of Don and Bill Clinton shaking hands. That's what I was a genius at selling myself. Mount Rushmore replica. I built a planetarium and an observatory. Challenger astronauts painted on the wall of a swimming pool submerged in water. When I was five years old, I started collecting butterflies and I still have that collection upstairs. Liberace's glass and gold staircase winding up to the top floor where a mannequin of Liberace sits holding a disco ball. I always wanted to be the best drum made out of human skulls. I just wanted the best collection. Replica of Little Boy Atomic Bomb, August 6, 1945, Hiroshima, Japan, next to a wooden sign that says, Entering Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, next to a cover of Hebrew Journal with dead and red letters over Osama bin Laden's face. When I had money, I didn't worry about what anything cost. Ronald Reagan painting hanging over a herd of crumbling carousel horses. If I loved it, then I bought. Liberace's piano bedazzled in tiny diamonds with his notated America the Beautiful sheet music on it. 
I estimate over time I've spent $10 million on things I've collected. Roman Colosseum replica. Wasn't a lot for me at the time. Houdini mannequin strapped to a chair with abundant restraints hanging upside down. I've been knighted five different times. Jeweled peacock. Like Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. Tiny Pinocchio. I even bought the house next door. Hotel Continental broken neon sign. Airplane with no roof. Roller coaster without a track. Started filling up that yard with... Old trains, railroad car seats, sign that says Dr. Don, honorary consul to Belize, woman mannequin in a conductor's hat and shirt and no pants. Then the neighbor next to that house ended up selling their house, so now I've got three houses in a row. Architectural rendering of Caesar's Palace in the 1970s. And, uh, it's just sort of fun. Light switch cover of a man with his pants around his ankles, so his penis is the light switch. My wife says it's like cancer, spreading from one yard to the next. Cross-section of the human brain, including the musculature, skeleton, and nasal passages. Hawaiian lady lamp, headhunter statue carved in wood, real human skull, human skull carved in wood, real hog head with seashells sewn into it, poster of parasites burrowing into skin. She has total control of the corner house. Pelican skeleton. I'm $750,000 in debt. I don't know how I'm going to pay my... Lifestyles of the rich and famous framed newspaper article on the wall, yellowed with age. If I don't pay my mortgage, I could lose my... Replica of the Statue of Liberty. This is the tomb I'm going to be buried in. Can you recognize me? Replica of Dawn lying in a steel lung inside a large yellow tomb painted with Egyptian hieroglyphs. I want to be remembered for all time. Peeling Jabberwocky. Then I'll go in the category of like Lincoln or Washington or dust in the crevices of the downed Apollo spacecraft. I'll be a piece of history. Airsats of Leonardo da Vinci's flying machine next to a print of the Mona Lisa next to Leonardo da Vinci's floating head. I want to be a spectacle. Muhammad Ali was a spectacle. Jesus was blue and yellow butterflies ascending in a glass wall. I want to become a collectible. John Wayne mannequin with worry lines wearing a Las Vegas t-shirt. I'll be pickled so I don't spoil. Don, an old man wearing smudgy glasses and an American flag t-shirt. I made it so you can't help but remember me. I'm Shelly. I'm 59 and I'm a retired sales clerk. Tim Gunn collection Barbie wearing a pencil skirt. On the box is a picture of Tim Gunn in a suit and glasses next to the words quality, taste, style. I guess I have to admit I am a hoarder. Thousands of Barbies. I love to play. Barbies inside boxes labeled with their years of creation. 1959, 1967, 1977 etc. They have all the different character Barbies. I Love Lucy Barbie, Scarlett O'Hara Barbie, Swan Lake Ballerina Barbie, Haunted Beauty Ghost Barbie, Firefighter Barbie, Sugar Plum Fairy Barbie, Hera Barbie, Mary Poppins Barbie, Architect Barbie, Faith Hill Barbie, Presidential Candidate Barbie, Kate Winslet and Titanic Barbie, Harpist Angel Barbie, Army Medic Barbie, Hard Rock Cafe Barbie, Splash and Color Changing Hair Barbie, Stars and Stripes Barbie, Film Director Barbie, Princess of the Danish Court Barbie, I Dream of Jeannie Barbie, Marie Antoinette Barbie, Tippi Hendren and the Birds Barbie, Grandma Barbie, Full House Barbie, Video Game Developer Barbie, Juicy Couture Barbie, Gymnastics Barbie, Claude Monet Water Series Barbie, Dentist Barbie, Dorothy Wizard of Oz Barbie, Barbie Loves Elvis Barbie, Marine Corps Barbie, Elizabeth Taylor and Cleopatra Barbie, Pioneer Barbie, Newborn Baby Doctor Barbie, Summer Splendor Barbie, Jewel Secrets Barbie, Gustav Klimt Barbie, Diva Barbie, Race Car Driver Barbie, Twilight Bella Barbie, Police Officer Barbie, Aphrodite Barbie, Computer Engineer Barbie, Rockstar Barbie, Perot Barbie, Olympic Skater Barbie, NASCAR Barbie, Astronaut Barbie, Haunted Beauty Zombie Bride Barbie, Ancient Rome Gladiator Barbie, Andy Warhol Barbie, etc. I know pretty much what I have, but it's just gotten out of hand. Original teenage fashion model Barbie from 1959 with winged eyeliner next to walk and potty pup Barbie with pink leash and tiny nuggets of poo. I have the outfits, shoes, matching. Tupperware stacked to the ceiling filled with Barbie accessories. The basement is totally covered with 
dolls from the movie Insurgent. In the kids' rooms, I have a lot of storage of my dolls, too. Two Bratz dolls huddled on a tiny bed. The pink-haired one is holding herself as if she is cold. The other has green skin, a tattered shirt, and a leg brace. Next to the Bratz is a their-sized Christmas tree. I spend most of my paychecks on tiny Barbie ornaments. Things have just piled up. Shelf with Scooby-Doo, Curious George, Frankenstein's Monster, Frowning Statue of Liberty Pillow, Headless Marilyn Monroe Barbie in a silver gown. Almost every room is touched with the mess. I love Jesus, heart night light shining on Elvis Ken in sparkling jumpsuit on a bathroom counter crammed with Avon products. My hoarding has left my family in debt and my house in disrepair. Shelf of Barbies with disheveled hair. Last couple of years, we've had a problem with... Barbie dream house with a pink plastic roof. We had a leak, so I hung a tarp from the ceiling so the water would drain into... Jacuzzi Barbie in a Barbie jacuzzi. Because of all the mess in the house, we couldn't have someone come in to check out. Barbie arms sticking out of a Target bag. Because I'm embarrassed. David Bowie poster overlooking a massive pile of Barbies with a Hunger Games Katniss Everdeen Barbie on top. My mother lives with us, and she can't even walk down the hallway because there's so much. Tiny Barbie shoes. All that's open is a chair, a TV, a path to the bathroom, a path to the... Grandmother asleep on a recliner in the living room. A Christmas cookie Yankee candle flickering next to her. Behind her, a pile of Barbies with a skeleton mask on top. In the corner, a Cabbage Patch doll in pioneer clothes reclines at the same angle as her. My mother sleeps in her chair because her bedroom is so full of in-touch magazines, including one with Michael Jackson on the cover wearing a dust mask. My daughter came in and she said, if you don't fix this, I'm going to call the authorities. Put grandma in. Pink Barbie lunch pail. I'm scared. Clown from It doll, grinning. Why ruin everyone's lives for dolls? Writes camera action doll with blue skin wearing a tattered dress. Hi, my name is Ivan Coyote and this is a piece I wrote called Last Train Out of the City. In 2011, I got a chance to go to Belfast for a queer arts festival, and largely because those two words, Belfast and queer, do not appear in sentences together nearly enough. I jumped at the chance, and I jumped on a plane, and I found myself telling stories in a small theater in the heart of the city on a Thursday night. At about 9 p.m., partway through the second half of my show, Decidedly mid-story, I heard an untuned orchestra of gymnasium-style metal chair legs squeaking against the concrete floor in concert, and about 10 or 15 members of the audience all got up together and left by the back door. Street lights and a car horn bled into the silent dark for a long moment, and then they were gone. I took a breath, waited for the rest of the crowd to settle for a couple of seconds, and continued, wondering exactly what it was that I had said to offend. The artistic director of the festival shook her head after the show and explained to me what had happened. Maybe I should have told you about it before. Sorry, sorry, love. Nothing to do with your set. That was lovely. It was just the last train to the country crowd that had to bugger off on time so they could get home and be up early to feed the chickens and the sheep and such. She told me more about it over a shot of Jameson's at the bar. Rural Northern Ireland was suffering from a brain drain of youngsters, she explained, who had grown up in small villages or on farms out in the country, but had been pilfered by London or Manchester and the like by the promise of jobs and nightlife and shopping and an end to the hard labour and perceived drudgery of rural life. This often left aging farmers without their children or grandchildren around to take over the family business. And these now elderly farmers were increasingly unable to maintain their properties and look after their animals. So this had birthed a kind of recent tradition now of single, often butch lesbians, who took jobs on these farms, helping out in exchange for a nominal wage and free housing. The trade-off in this conservative and Catholic part of the world was that there was an unspoken law 
that these women should live alone, without partners, and remain quietly in the closet. This struck me full in the chest, like the flat and hard side of a pair of fists. That's who had left the theater just after 9 p.m., a bunch of butch farmers who had to take the last train out of the city to get back to their empty farmhouses so they could shutter up the sheep and check the chicken coops before the moon set behind the rolling hills of someone else's farmlands. I just dug around in my Facebook past and I found a post from earlier that same day. Posted right after I had taught a workshop to a couple of those butch farmers, but before I knew about the last train to the country. November 13th, 2011. I just finished teaching a workshop, got to see a big old bush with steel-toed work boots on cry quietly in her chair while writing something down. She said at the beginning that she always wanted to write, but never did on account of her terrible spelling, but yet there she was, cranking it out. Ever seen anything more beautiful than that? I haven't. Not for a while, anyway. Belfast, you move me. You do. Five years later, I was in Brisbane, Australia at the Queensland Poetry Festival, a dream gig, beautiful venue, warm, humid night, sold out crowd, standing ovation. There was a long lineup in the theater lobby after the show, folks wanting to hug or shake hands, buy books, take pictures. I will never forget her, even though I I can't remember her name. And there were about a dozen people that looked a lot like her lingering in the lobby of that big theatre that night in Queensland five years ago. She was wearing a striped button-down dress shirt and faded jeans with frayed cuffs and a worn leather belt and hiking boots, barbershop haircut. She smelled of tobacco and Old Spice deodorant. She needed to talk. And so I listened, even though there were people waiting and growing restless behind her. She told me how much she loved the show and that there were at least ten places where she would have cried if she were the crying in public type, which she definitely was not. She told me how she grew up on a farm in the outback without community, without role models, without pride parades or flags, without ever holding hands in public with her lover, without books or movies that contained characters that looked anything like her. Nothing, no one, never, not ever. She told me that Queensland, of all of the states in Australia, had historically been the most brutal to its queer people. Consensual sex between gay men was illegal in the state from 1895 until 1991. The maximum sentence was seven years in prison. And that all through the 70s and 80s, which also happened to be her formative years, Queensland was governed by the socially conservative National Party, led by a real piece of work, she said, something, something, Peterson. And during that time, gay men were not permitted to be school teachers, and the government actively used homophobia as a hammer to forge electoral advantages, le- linking being gay to pedophilia and moral deviancy. They even passed a liquor law. Making, making it an offense to serve alcohol to perverts, child molesters, and deviants, or to allow them to remain on licensed premises. Though most of the laws were targeting gay men, Peterson's homosexual deviants laws specifically allowed bar owners to call police on patrons suspected of being lesbians. Nothing changed legally until 1991, she told me. Imagine trying to find yourself in that climate, she asked, her eyes wet with tears that she blinked to control. We, we weren't allowed to put posters up or take out ads in the papers that even used the word homosexual or gay or lesbian and transgender. She shook her shorn head. I don't even. They tried to make it impossible for us to find each other. But still, we managed it. But it was dangerous. You understand me? So, 
for me to see you up there tonight, telling me my story a little. Under all those lights, looking a lot like I did 20 years back, with all of these people gathered here, well, I'm trying to even find the words for how I feel right now. Look at us, eh? Here we are. And fuck them, I say. Because here we fucking are. You know? So. I've written a few words for those older Irish butches. And the Aussie ones too. And the ones living in a one bedroom in Barrie, Ontario. And under pandemic lockdown in Pakistan. And an inherited townhouse somewhere in Arizona. All of you. All of us. You might use the word butch or trans man or gender queer or non-binary. Maybe you are a masculine of center or a stud or maybe you shirk any and all of these labels. All of these are only words. And words are never big enough to hold all of us all of the time. All I need to do is catch a glimpse of you on the street, in the grocery store, in the park, walking your stiff and trembling old dog. And I see you. And I know you are my brother, my sister, my sibling, my family. We belong by not belonging. They have always tried to disappear us, to force us to fit. We have forever been the second left foot, the mother wearing army boots, the bearded lady, the black sheep, and the back row of everyone's family photo, the bruised and sore thumb that cannot help but stick out of a clenched fist. We deliver the mail and teach gym class and work the night shift at the hospital and shear the sheep and mow the lawns and answer the phones and take care of someone else's grandparents. They tried to uninvite us to the feminist discussion circles in the 70s, and they ousted our trans sisters from their collectives and shelters and music festivals, too. They have divided our ranks, but never truly conquered us. Never all the way. I see some of my future in you. I always have. I want us to gather together somewhere when we are able to again. Because now we know, yeah, how much this time together must never be taken for granted, never wasted. We will lean in close and tell each other where to get a secondhand suit altered, where the friendly barbers are in this town, and where to buy pants that do not accentuate these hips. I am sorry that we all built ourselves on crumbling foundations and modeled our versions of masculinity on the only examples we were provided, the heroic and stoic and damaged and damaging. On handsome like Han Solo, on our absent or unavailable fathers and our problematic uncles, but I know between us we can help ourselves be better. I want to let the tears flow and talk about the hurt some of us still hide under booze or beards or bravado. I want to talk together about how we have sometimes skirted, no pun intended, just under the violent eye of the state, that the laws and lawmakers that seek to police and punish queerness almost always aim and fire at our queer brothers and our trans sisters, that they often target our queens and shoot over the heads of kings. I want to speak about the consequences of this, because though we are sometimes invisible, we are never bulletproof. I don't want us to ever draw lines in the sand based on what we call ourselves or our testosterone levels, breast or flat chest or M or F or X or bind or pack or pluck or who you fuck, I promise I will not line up separately for justice or be divided into shifting categories or imposed borders or imprecise pronouns. Because it is not true that words will never hurt us. Tonight, when you catch that last train out of the city, 
I want you to know that you are part of a multitude. I want you to know that your family is waiting and that we will recognize you when you get home. <laughs>